Studio with Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Matt, good morning to you. Good morning. Good, good to be here. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Johnny, good morning. When's the next book due, sir? The next book is due in July, and then the next book comes out in August. You have to finish writing by July. Is it, is it beginning, middle, end, or whenever in July you're done? Uh, I think it's July 15th. I'm not, I'm not sure. July is so far oh, out there. But, you know, so far away. Yeah. Wait a minute. I thought, you, I thought your books were due in the fall. Well, that's the other series. Different series. So I have October 15th. Actually, I'm out of that contract now. So I've signed a new contract for four books, two books each in different series. But instead of delivering on, a, on an annual basis, I'm delivering on a nine-month basis. So the, the due dates are going to be moving around a lot. So do you actually sit there and do the typing yourself or do you have some sort of AI generated dictation that you can just speak and Oh, I have my staff take care of all no. Yeah, I, I sit down and I and I type. Okay, you don't use like that dragon dictation or No. No, you I mean the dictation, you know, paragraph, open quote, hello, comma, close quote, he said, period, open quote, too how much are work. you today? You know, it's just too much work. Yeah. That wouldn't but you, your new crazy. series, though, is is a female. Uh, it is. Irene right? Rivers was the FBI director in the Jonathan Graves series, and now she's getting her own series because the book that comes out in the book that comes out in August, her career kind of doesn't go well. Do you find yourself now thinking more like a woman as you go through your day? <laughs> do you do you remember everything someone ever said to you that was wrong? Do you? I'm not. Do you remember what your spouse did 38 years ago that ticked you off? You can dangle that bait all you want. I ain't going there. <laughs> So yes is the answer. <laughs> Our guest in this segment is uh, former delegate John Doyle. John is running for state senate. Good morning, Mr. Doyle. How are you? Splendid yourselves, and good morning, everybody else. Marvelous. Good morning. Marvelous to have you with us. Uh, John, you are lobbying on behalf of three different uh, interest groups in the state capitol. If you could once again review those three for us, John. Yes, it's West Virginia Free, which is a women's rights organization, uh, women's health care in particular. Uh, and uh, uh, another one is West Virginia Citizens Action Group, which is a pro-consumer organization. Uh, and I'm also lobbying for a group from the Potomac Highlands called West Virginia Clean and Beautiful, which uh, are environmental and land use oriented. Are you making any progress on behalf of those three groups as this session moves along? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your <laughs> candidness well, there, sir. Here's so. the deal. We're, we're only at the, at the midpoint of the session today. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of what is, is finalized is in the uh, really the last half of the session. It really takes the first half of the session for bills to begin winding their way through. And in particular, very few uh, bills from the other house are taken up by either house now right. uh, they tend to wait until the 50th day which is what's called crossover day and after that day uh th the house may only uh take up senate bills that have been passed by the senate and the senate can only take up house bills that have been passed by the house so the both houses tend to wait uh for the most part on bills that come from the other house John, as a realistic goal, when these three organizations hired you in a capital where the Senate ratio is 31 Republicans to three Democrats, the House ratio is 89 Republicans to 11 Democrats, the governor is a Republican, all the constitutional officers are Republican. What is a realistic goal these folks have in mind when they hire you to lobby on their behalf in that environment? Well, I get along with a whole lot of the Republicans down here. They're all friends of mine. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't mean they'll vote your way, though. No, no. But the, the deal is for me to explain to them uh, exactly what a bill is about from our perspective, if it's a bill we dislike. And, and, and in most cases, uh, given the makeup of the legislature and the governor, the most of the bills are – that, that we have an, uh, about which we have an opinion, and this is I'm speaking really for all three organizations now. Uh, most of them are our bills that we do have concerns about, and sometimes what we can do uh, is persuade legislators to make uh, a change or two in the bill, which will ease uh, our primary concern. Say, 
and uh, we're we've been able to do that before. I say before we those organizations, the two that have been around a while, West Virginia Free and West Virginia Citizens Action Group. Uh, West Virginia Clean and Beautiful was just formed a few months ago, so uh, they're they're really new at this. But uh, anyway. I appreciate the I, uh, distinction you made. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, everybody I talk to is willing to listen, and sometimes we can make some headway. And it's not necessarily about getting bills passed all the time so much as it might be, as you mentioned, tweaking a bill or perhaps making sure the bill doesn't get passed. Yes, that's exactly right. So the victories can that's come in various ways. That's the bulk of my forms. work, really. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad way to spend the day, John. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. <laughs> what what bills are eating up most of your effort and time right now, John? Well, right now, there's a public hearing that I'm supposed to be in attendance at. It started at 830, uh, and I'm going to need to break away from here by about five till. I hope that's okay with you guys. That's fine. Uh, given your lineup, I'm sure that you can fill the remaining five minutes with, uh, with, with meaningful discussion. Uh, <laughs> but it's a bill called the Women's <laughs> Bill of Rights. And from our perspective, I'm here on behalf of uh, West Virginia Free, it is anything but. Uh, it, it Basically, if you read the bill, in, at least in my view, it's one of those things that takes us back to the 19th century uh, when women are supposed to be um, happy uh, in the home, sweeping the floor and cooking. So, uh, John, is, is there more to it than, than this as well? I, I, when, when Senator Hannah Geffert was in uh, office, she mentioned a discussion that she was trying to have to get some wording changed in some of the official state documents, like the Constitution, where you might go to it is addressing men. She wanted to have and women added to it as well so that women were recognized in the same uh, sentences as men were for some of the rights that they had. Is this something that's attached to that, or is that no, a totally different there's effort? there's nothing in this bill about that. I got you. Okay. There's nothing in this bill about equal pay for women. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the things that I consider, would consider to be in a women's bill of rights are not in this bill. So, John, this is Gil Strap. If, um, I'm going to guess that take women back to the 19th century is not in yeah, the John, wording. Can you talk a little bit louder? I I don't know. <laughs> I can. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There we go. There we go. Um, the actual language of the bill does not include taking women back to the 19th century, right? So, what are the elements that are offensive? Not, not what's not in the bill, but what is in the bill that you find offensive? There, it, it's, it's more the tone than anything. It really doesn't add any, any right in, in there that, that, that women don't have already. It's, it's more like the tone is saying, you have these rights, therefore you should be happy. Yeah. Why? Why does this bill exist? I mean, what is, what is the what? Oh, this what is the itch, governor's bill. Well, he what had, itch he does he think he's scratching? And announced that he was submitting it, and I I I firmly believe that it's really a an, an, a bill to uh, elect Jim Justice to the U.S. Senate. Well, if I were Jim Justice, I might want to get that through as well. But <laughs> 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 but is there is there a specific need that he thinks he's addressing through this bill? Yeah, I, 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 I must apologize. I, am, I found the quietest spot that I could, but there are people down the hall who are talking pretty loud, and it's, and it's kind of ricocheting off the walls here. So I'm not hearing everything each of you is saying. May, well, when John, repeat it for you, John. Maybe you're not having as direct a, you know, is, is there a specific itch the governor is scratching with this bill? John, why he need, why he thought it needed to be addressed? It's just uh, uh, trying to portray himself as a conservative uh, because he's being accused by by uh, Alex Mooney of being a rhino. He's trying to prove he's not a rhino. I just want to know how loud do people have to talk for John Doyle to say that they're talking loudly? That's (laughs) well, it's no. When I'm at the hotel room, which is what I was last week, there was no problem. But because I had to be in the Capitol for this hearing, and I, I, I found a spot that I thought would be quiet, uh, and, and it is for a good bit of the time, but, but if somebody down the hall decides to speak in anything more than a normal tone of voice, uh, it ricochets off of these marble walls and, and uh, Understood. kind of interferes with my understanding of the questions you're asking. 
What else uh, concerns you legislatively down there, John? Well, Senate Bill 171, which is being opposed by West Virginia Clean and Beautiful, uh, it is a bill that has the, the, the potential to uh, seriously interfere uh, with the Planning Commission activity of counties that have zoning. Uh, Hardy County, and most of the people that formed West Virginia Clean and Beautiful are from Hardy County, although they've now been joined by people from, from Hampshire and Grant and Mineral and Pendleton, you know, the counties uh, in the uh, Potomac Highlands, the, uh, the fatter part of the eastern panhandle. And basically what it says is, that the county, the, 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 neither the county commission nor the planning commission can make any rules relate, relating to agricultural operations that are any more stringent than the state. The problem is when it comes to things like um, sinking wells, it, uh, it, it, it really defines agriculture as anything that's done on a farm, at, and it, it can be interpreted to include, say, a paper mill. If somebody wants to put that on their farm, uh, it, it really came from Pilgrim's Pride, the, the, the big chicken operation in Hardy County. Uh, and they have a whole lot of these uh, chicken houses that are several hundred feet long. Uh, and uh, they're, they're beginning to use up so much water that small farmers in Hardy County are seeing that their wells are not producing as much water as they used to. And the state does not regulate that. Uh, so if we if we if we say to the county you can't regulate that, uh, nobody's going to going to uh, save the uh, uh, help the, the the small farmers. And and the I irony is this bill is being supported by the West Virginia Farm Bureau, and really it is not in the interest of most small farmers. Uh, the Farm Bureau these days really is an an organization that represents uh, big agriculture, which includes things like Pilgrim's Pride. Jefferson County is not included in this, John? Uh, it could conceivably be. Uh, yeah, a any county uh, that has any zoning, whether it's countywide, and you know, Berkeley County has partial zoning. They've zoned Tuscarora District, so even Berkeley County would be affected by this. Oh, there are county commissioners all over the state that are, that are screaming bloody murder, but uh, uh, the governor wants it because it's my understanding, and I didn't find this out till yesterday. The governor wants it on his desk really by this weekend, so they may suspend the rules today and try and uh, it, it will, it'll be reported to the floor today. Uh, and normally what would happen is it would be on first reading tomorrow, second reading Monday, which is amendment stage, and then third reading Tuesday. But apparently the, 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 the rumor is that Pilgrim's Pride is going to make a big announcement about an expansion, and the governor wants to take credit for it, so he, he, he wants the bill on his desk as soon as he can get it. Matt Harvey. Good morning, John. Did you happen to see Leadership Jefferson when they were down there last week? No, I did not. I didn't or, know they were coming. I get or this week. Um, what other bill? What other issues do you see coming on the horizon? Well, those are the two I've been spending most of my time on. Uh, there now, there are some election bills that uh, uh, that I'm working on on uh, West Virginia Citizens Action Group on behalf of Citizens Action Group. And there, there are a number of bills that we think restrict voting too much. See, I'm, I'm, my view is that, that we should make voting easier, not more difficult. Uh, I've, I've said on the show before, I think that uh, I'd like to see a law passed that said a county of 50,000 people or more should be required to have um, um, at least three uh, uh, early voting locations. Uh, and uh, right now, it's simply up to the county. Uh, and that would be a minimum. They could have more if they wanted. But And if it's 35,000 or more, they should have at least two. But uh, I just think that, uh, and particularly Secretary of State Mac Warner has submitted some bills that, that uh, um, for example, there's one bill that's going to require a real photo ID. Now, right now, we require ID, and it works fine. We have enough requirements in the law that anybody that tries to, to, uh, uh, to vote illegally is going to be caught. It's, it's, it's lead pipe cinch. But for some reason, he wants to make it even tougher. Uh, and, I, and again, I think he thinks it'll help him get elected governor. I don't think there's any way in the world he can be elected governor, but he seems to think that he can be. 
John, Joe Ferretti on our Facebook page as we retreat back to the Women's Bill of Rights summed it up as saying the legislation essentially clarifies that all statutory rights applying are currently in place for women apply only to persons who were biological yeah, females I, at I birth. I can't hear you at all. Well, that's going to create a problem because sound is everything on this show. Uh, so uh, do you want to end the segment now, John? Do you need to go? Can you hear anything at all? Something happened, and you guys, you're, 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 all, all of you are now like you're whispering. Oh, well, we're not, so I don't know what else to tell you on that I, one. I, I believe you. I, I can barely hear you, and there's nobody talking around here now. All it's right. just all of a sudden the signal went to... Uh, well, and uh, I didn't move. Uh, you have a few minutes left, so you have to go. So I'll leave it open ended. There we go. I hear you. So uh, uh, I'm not going to go back and reread what I was going to do. We'll revisit that later on. Uh, the final segment for you, John, is to tell us what's the last, uh, the next bill that you're concerned about right now in uh, Charleston. Well, <laughs> I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> there, there, there are dozens of them. Yeah, well, summarize a few of them for us, John. Ask me what you were going to ask me now that I can hear you. Well, Joe Ferretti summed up the Women's Bill of Rights on our Facebook page by saying it essentially clarifies that all statutory rights currently in place for women apply only to persons who are biological females at birth. At least that's the intent. The wording of the current legislation could be problematic. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think really you mentioned that. Trans bill. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think you mentioned that at all and uh, I, when you I should it have up. i apologize my bad yeah uh so in, in regards to that aspect of it uh are there any other thoughts you want to share on that no i just think yeah i've talked to a whole lot of young people uh, uh, uh college students and, and high school students they really don't care about this issue other than some of them do care about the sports teams aspect of it but any other aspect of the trans question, nobody gives a tinker's damn about it. It's just something, it's, it's an issue that I think uh, folks on the right think will help them in the election and that that's why they're doing this. And I really don't think it will. In regards to sports, John, in the context of that, does that change your thoughts about it in any way? Let's specifically talk about high school sports. Um, I actually think uh, that, that what we should do is have sports teams just for trans athletes. And I realize it would cost some money, uh, and it, it primarily on, uh, from, from a travel standpoint, uh, but uh, I, that to me is, is the ultimate solution to the problem. Uh, we're probably not going to get there for a few years. But uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I think to, to, to pass a ban just for the sake of passing a ban is, is showboating. Uh, and, and, again, m m some of the pe people I've, – I've talked to uh, women athletes at Shepherd over the last several years about this. And, and basically they say they're concerned about it. But I I'm not yet run into one that said, I think it should be banned. Yeah. John, I know you have to get going, so thanks for your time this morning. Much appreciated. You're welcome, and uh, we're, we're doing it at 8 a.m. next week, right? I'll have to look that up and text you back. Okay, because uh, I will Yeah, uh, I will be in the hotel next week, so uh, we won't have this hearing problem. I apologize. Thank you, John. Sure thing. Bye. John Doyle lobbying on behalf of three different groups. For those of you listening uh, who are asking me why I was yelling during the interview... <laughs> Uh, uh, John obviously had some trouble hearing us. I'm not sure what happened there other than the fact that it's Charleston and sometimes it's what it is. The acoustics are very strange in the Capitol. They are. Very strange. Right, and especially if you're trying to talk or listen on a uh, mobile phone. Yep. So uh, the issue, you know, John suggested what a lot of people regard as a common sense answer to the trans uh, concerns in regards to uh, athletics and that is they should create specific teams but i don't know that that would necessarily be appealing to those who uh favor uh, favor uh, rights uh, trans rights so i don't know that that's the actual answer because I, I don't know that that's is it that big of a population that they could field a team of anything i don't know in west virginia probably not in some more metropolitan areas maybe so 
Well, <clears throat> I'm reading. I'm reading through the bill obviously while I'm talking at the same time, so it's going to be incomplete. But what this addresses is that a, a female is a female, and it goes in the definition of was a female. Male has male parts. Um, equal does not mean same or identical with respect to equality of the sexes. A person's sex is his or her biological sex at birth. There are only two sexes, and for each, every individual is either male or female. Sex is objective and fixed, and fe sex does not include gender identity or other terms intended to convey a person's subjective sense of self. And it goes from there. So this is, I, I don't, <laughs> Women's Bill of Rights is kind of an odd title mm -hmm. for, for this, but that seems to be the entire focus of it, is the definition of terms of, of what we classically have thought of men and women as is now they're, they're codifying it in the law from what I can see here. Uh, the one point John made about uh, for younger people, it's not as big of a deal. I think that's probably true. Uh, I, I know the kids in my neighborhood, all kind of the same age as they grew up, they've now moved on and you know most of them have graduated from high school or college. And so you don't see them as much as you did when they were little and run around the neighborhood. But in, in talking with those uh, kids, they, it's, just an, it's just another thing to them. It's just not a big deal, right? Now, I don't know in regards to women's sports and athletes competing if it was a big deal to them or not because it never came up in conversation. But in terms of addressing everyday life and interacting and whatever, uh, many of them were very protective of their friends who, uh, if you, whatever category you want to fit under with all the letters, you know, they were very supportive of it. So I think for older people, it's a bigger concern than it is for younger people in much of the way we think of it as a big concern. Well, I think a lot of the consternation for me comes just words matter. Mm -hmm. And if, if the younger generations want to go ahead and, and use new pronouns and all that, okay, fine, I don't get it, but that's fine. Just don't expect me to do it because I, it's not that I'm unwilling to make the change. I don't think I have the cognitive capacity to make the change. Mm -hmm. You know, pronouns come pretty naturally when you're referring to. Well, someone. When, when I take my coach's exams every, you have to go through however many it is, 10 or 11 online courses you have to take as a teacher. And I'm, I'm not a teacher, but I'm considered in that category. So I have to take all the online courses as well every summer. Uh, some of the regulations and rules that, that are put in the district where I coach is that teachers are expected to know the individual personal pronoun for every student in their class, which I think is a lot to ask when you consider how many students or in a classroom every class throughout the course of a day. And this isn't like third grade where you stay in the same classroom all day. The kids move in and out of classrooms as the, the periods change. To know the preferred personal pronoun of every single kid, which could change day to day or month to month, or what you prefer to be referred by, to put that onus on the teacher and it becomes a disciplinary situation if, if you don't abide by it, to me that's a lot to ask. Teachers have enough on their plate already of what they have to remember what they have to do and what's expected of them every single day to have to remember this in addition to so many other things as well. I think that's a lot. And then you throw in the fact that teenagers in particular are, are hardwired to mess with the heads of adults. That's what they do well. So, you know, and, and each other and each other. It, so yeah. to empower them to, to be able to change their pronoun or anything, you know, on a, a, on a daily basis, it just, it's an, un, it gives them an unfair advantage over their teachers.